Have you ever noticed the West's idea of much of the world is a little, um, warped? Ah, uh, the third world. The place where starving ethnic babies wait around for white people to teach them English. I was once watching a journalist panel. I'm a journalist. Or I was a journalist before the world broke. One fucking bad. And on this panel was a foreign correspondent from a prestigious publication. One of the New York ones. And he said, and I quote, everything beyond our borders is one big slum. Really? Everything? Canada? Argentina? Oman? Togo? Actually, I really don't know anything about Togo. According to Wikipedia, it has valuable phosphate deposits. Hmm, good for her. Anyway, it was a pretty bold statement for, you know, a uh, foreign correspondent to be making about the entire world. And while there's a long, rich history of blustery white men making similarly bizarre statements about other cultures, the hominins are quite inscrutable. We well, have to admit, I make a damn fine cabinet. His words stayed with me because I feel like they kind of represent what a lot of people in the West really feel. I mean, most Americans might not think that France is one big slum, but I think a lot of Latin America, Africa, and South Asia gets lumped into this category. Now the term third world has fallen out of use in favor of more PC terms such as developing countries, which is certainly a step in the right direction. But at the same time, developing countries is still essentially a euphemism for the exact same idea. And some nations are ahead and others, for, you know, some reason, are struggling to catch up to, you know, the uh, futuristic utopia we've built here in America. Multiple people are dead following the mass shooting. This is Hey, snowball. Open the door slowly, get out! What's going on? Yeah, we're talking about it. Pay just $750 in taxes. The number of people living on the streets and in shelters has soared. Hashtag first world problems. So I wanted to take a look at the term third world, where it comes from. Spoilers, it's Mao. And how its meaning has changed over time, affecting not just our perceptions, but the shape of our global landscape and simplifying the world for many into this versus this. Have you ever wondered if there's a first world and there's a third world, what happened to the second world? Well, it no longer exists, except on very specific parts of Twitter. The division of the world into three parts is a Cold War concept, inherited from the days in which the US and the Soviet Union were duking it out to see who would fill the power vacuum left behind by the British Empire. The first mention of Third World on record appeared in the 1952 article Three Worlds, One Planet by French academic Alfred Savy. In it, he divided the world into three realms, the capitalists, the communists, and the rest. There was America, its allies, and the countries it was controlling. And then there was the Soviet Union, its allies, and the countries it was controlling. The last two categories kind of blur. And then there were the newly independent post-colonial nations that had yet to pick a side. This tripartite division was inspired by the class divisions of the French Revolution, where society was split into the first second and third estate, which represented respectively the nobility, the clergy, and the common people. Now in Savi's original analogy, the first world is the nobility, makes sense. The third world, the commoners, also makes sense. And the communists were the clergy. I'm sure it makes sense if you're French. Third world took off as a term for the reason that many global divisions stick because it reflected America's current geopolitical strategy, which at the time was quick, wire Congress so we can write a check before the natives go commie. Non-aligned countries were basically seen as unclaimed turf in the global battle for dominance. After independence, you'd basically get a knock on your door from the US and they'd be like, what'll it be boys? Mother Russia or Uncle Sam? If you chose America, you'd receive money and military aid. Not to mention a hot invitation to their latest military quagmire. 
and if you said no, you'd lose America's friendship. And by friendship, I do mean guns. As a newly independent country, it really helps to have a superpower on your side to back you up diplomatically, to sell arms to you, and to form common markets. And because the Soviet Union went belly up, the countries that allied with the US had a big advantage later on. It's not a coincidence that Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea are doing so well economically. They were key allies during the Cold War for various reasons. It really just helps to have America on your side. Third world during this period is almost a miscellaneous category. Leftovers in the geopolitical bargain bin for allies. But in the 1970s, the term gets reclaimed by none other than the chairman himself, Chairman Miao. It's Mao who reclaims the term third world and reshapes it to something more akin to our modern use. The original division split the post-colonial world according to their Cold War stance, neutral, pro-America, or pro-Soviet Union. But after China breaks up with the Soviet Union, Mao needs a new spin. He calls this three worlds theory. Mao divides the world into the imperialist first world, which represents America and the Soviet Union. It was a bad breakup. Second world, he defines as the second tier of wealthy nations, places like Western Europe and also Japan. Third world, he defines as the underdeveloped world, the post-colonial nations that had been exploited by imperial powers. Like our modern use of the term, this new model group nations from most developed to least. But unlike our modern term, there was a moral progression from oppressive to oppressed. The new spin reflected China's geopolitical interests. Just like America was trying to figure out ways to justify propping up repressive regimes in order to like further democracy, China needed a way to justify allying itself with regimes that were not exactly proletariat friendly. 1974, future leader of China, Deng Xiaoping, brings up the Maoist model in his speech to the UN. Because if you want an idea to go viral, head to the UN. Do you kids want to be like the real UN? Or do you just want to squabble and waste time? In his speech, he decries the imperialist behavior of the US and the Soviet Union. He urges the third world to unify against neo-colonialism encroaching on the world order, and it totally worked. The nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America rose as one to end the neo-colonial building of the West and hearken unto the world a new post-colonial, post-white supremacist, post-capitalist age of unity and equality. Yeah, that's, that's not what happens. Mao's third world theory was pretty typical of the kind of rhetoric that was coming out of the post-colonial world during much of the 20th century. Newly independent nations were rising one by one out of the ashes of the old imperial order. There was a feeling of daring ideological optimism in the air and an immense distrust of capitalism for some reason. It was like the Franz Fanon era. And revolutionary leaders all over the world were envisioning what a post-capitalist, post-colonialist, post-white supremacist world was going to look like. Malcolm X was reading Gandhi. Gandhi was reading Du Bois. There was pan-Africanism, pan-Arabism. There were even efforts to make a kind of post-colonial UN like the 1955 conference in Indonesia. This is the first intercontinental conference of colored peoples in the history of mankind. But there is one person who was not impressed by the utopian rhetoric, Lee Kuan Yew. Just a warning, every time you say Lee Kuan Yew's name, somewhere a neoliberal reaches climax. He's just so pragmatic. Oh, Lee Kuan Yew, your GDP is enormous. Lee Kuan Yew was the father of modern Singapore, and it was his goal to make Singapore a, quote, first world oasis in a third world region. At least that's what he wrote in his book about it. From first world to third world, 
the Singapore story. When Singapore achieved independence in 1965, it was in a pretty difficult position. It's one of the few countries in history to have achieved independence involuntarily. Malaysia expelled Singapore, deciding that their majority ethnic Chinese population was more trouble than it was worth. It's kind of like if America decided that Detroit had too many black people and then just abandoned it. Actually, maybe that happened. Anyway, Singapore's position was far from enviable. They were an unindustrialized nation state that didn't even have access to drinking water and was on terrible terms with their neighbors. After independence, India sends an economic advisor to create a strategy for Singapore. And the advisor recommends that they form a common market with Malaysia. And Lee Kuan Yew is like, yo, Fuck that. So he dismisses that guy and hires instead a Dutch economist to advise him. And this guy gives him a series of recommendations to make Singapore an attractive place for Western multinational corporations. One of the first things Lee Kuan Yew does is make the communist party in Singapore illegal, as opposed to countries like India, which allowed them to participate in free democratic elections. But Lee Kuan Yew doesn't want any Western investors worried that their Nike factory is going to get nationalized any minute by the People's Liberation Front. Dutch economist also recommends that Singapore keeps all of its colonial staff choose and keeps all of the colonial era street names because usually after a revolution you change your street names from like King George Road to George Washington Road. The Economist knows that if investors see reels of Asian people pulling down statues of white men who aren't Lenin, it'll make investors nervous. So after this Lee Kuan Yew heads to America and he schmoozes he schmoozes hard. He's both Oxford and Harvard educated. And he spends a lot of time figuring out how to talk to American businessmen to tell them what they want to hear. So he wines and dines them and says things like, we're not looking for handouts. We're hard working folk trying to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And we come cheap and we'll make your taxes real low. When he finally gets some investors to agree to come see Singapore, he makes absolutely sure that the area from the airport to their hotel is completely clean, not a bit of trash on the road. It's surrounded by golf courses and manicured greenery. Because he knows if they see one piece of trash or one lady with a pot on her head or God forbid, a cow on the road, they'll be like, this is some third world shit. We're taking our business elsewhere. The strategy was enormously successful. Singapore to this day has one of the highest GDPs and remains very Western friendly. It's stable, safe, and most importantly, clean. You know how many Westerners, when I tell them I live in India, say, oh, isn't it dirty? And regale me with a story about how they visited India one time and got food poisoning their entire visit. Well, maybe you made India sick too, Francois. Singapore's stability proved a stark contrast to the general drama of the post-colonial world and its many alliances. The utopian rhetoric ended up being pretty utopian. Pan-Africanism, Pan-Arabism, and other unification movements failed. And Mao, Mr. Three Worlds Theory, could talk a really big game when it came to anti-imperialism, but he pretty quickly declared war on his biggest third world ally, India. And also he declared war on birds at a certain point. Yeah, that was a lot. And China ends up making diplomatic overtures to the US and being on pretty bad terms with countries like India. So the alternatives to American hegemony basically fall apart. China and India start moving economically right, liberalizing their economies beginning in the 70s and 80s. When the Soviet Union falls in 1991, it's the death knell for an alternative to global capitalism. And countries start scrambling to try to do what Singapore did, open up their markets in order to become the newest member of the First World Club. 
Hey there, post-colonial nations. Are you sick and tired of first world countries looking down on your nation? Of their tourists buying slum tours of your low-income neighborhoods? Of your political dissonance getting nominated for Nobel Peace Prizes? Well, there may be a better way. The Singapore model. With just a few billion dollars in foreign investment, you can take a country that looks like this and turn it into this. So you can finally get the respect you deserve. So the Cold War ends and with it, the idea of third world countries being mere tools in either the spread or the fight against global communism. Instead, the third world is viewed through a development lens. Just like Mao's three worlds theory, the term third world is now your level of development. But without the ideological components of exploitation or imperialism, there's now a path to joining the first world, at least in theory. The problem with quick development is you have to convince Westerners you're worth developing. But unlike Singapore, you're probably not a tiny city state. And the chances that you also happen to have an extremely talented leader and a deeply centralized government are pretty small. Like if you're the prime minister of India, you can't just tell people not to pull down the colonial statues. You can't just be like, hey guys, so I know Winston Churchill was an imperialist who you consider personally responsible for the Bengal famine that killed 3 million people, but I have a meeting with Nike in the morning, and it would be really good if you guys could just be cool for a few more decades. Yeah, thanks. You want to be the prime minister for much longer. You also can't just seize people's land and turn it into golf courses. And you can't stop people from rural areas moving into your city capital and setting up camp on the sidewalk. Can if you're China, however. China, under the post-Mao leadership of Deng Xiaoping, draws a lot of inspiration from the Singapore model, and it continues to do so to this day. Beijing and Shanghai are spotlessly clean cities for this reason. The government is very aware that most foreigners don't really stray outside of these cities, and that first impressions matter a lot. You drive up north from Beijing, things get a lot more third worldy. In China, internal migration is regulated. Not everyone can move to cities like Beijing or Shanghai. And there were multiple government campaigns to kill all the street animals. So when foreign investors go to Shanghai to do business, they don't see beggars or cows in the road. They see nice restaurants and far less trash than you'd see on the streets of New York. Westerners go away thinking, well, China's really going places. And when they go to India, they see slums, child beggars, and cows in the road. And they think, fun big slum. I'm not saying the difference between China and India is optics. China is a fully industrialized country and India is not. But perception plays an enormous role in whether or not the West takes you seriously. And to control your optics, you have to fight Western biases. For hundreds of years, Europeans were justifying colonialism by saying, look how poor these people are. What would they do without us? Never mind the fact that the famine and the poverty was being caused by European economic exploitation. Because it turns out that when you invade a country, dismantle its government, and rule it with a military corporation that forces it to grow cash crops instead of, you know, food, it's not great for the locals. Scholars estimate that 8.2 million people died in the Indian famines that occurred during the 1870s alone. That's eight times more than the Irish potato famine, and about seven times more the deaths of US soldiers in every war we ever fought. But when you take a stock image of a hungry, dark-skinned child and stick it on an international charity organization's website, or a blonde girl holding a black baby on a volunteer website, the implication is they still need us. Take up the white man's burden, young lass, and go take selfies of yourself in Nairobi. Third world becomes a brand, a charity brand. You don't invest in a third world country you donate to it. But who's going to invest in a, you know, shithole country? Who's gonna throw their money into one big slum? <laughs> 
begins as a Cold War concept. It's reclaimed as a Maoist concept and then becomes a neoliberal concept with heavy overtones of racism and colonial baggage. Efforts to use the term developing countries in many ways is a step in the right direction because it's more specific describing a state of infrastructure. And because third world at this point has soaked up so much paternalism over the decades, it's best to just discard it and start afresh. But at the same time, the term developing countries carries the exact same implications as third world versus first. That there is one path to human progress, and that is becoming more like the West. The implication is that someday, countries like India will get their shit together, get their cows off the road and into burgers, and transform into Canada 2.0, at which point Western countries will be opening up olive gardens on the moon. Progress. It's linear. I almost prefer the term third world because it doesn't have the pseudo objectivity of the term developing countries. Like developing countries has the vibe of a wonkish technocrat shuffling a sheaf of papers and saying, well, that's just what the stats say. You like stats? Here's some stats. Did you know that the US has the highest imprisonment rate in the world? Higher than even in repressive dictatorships like North Korea and Turkmenistan? That it has the fourth highest wealth disparity only, surpassed by Russia, Sweden, and the Netherlands? That our life expectancy rate is lower than that in Chile, Colombia, and Turkey? And that our Congress has a lower percentage of women than in the lower parliamentary houses of Rwanda, Chile, and Cuba. These are just out-of-context cherry-picked statistics. But how often do we use out-of-context statistics to prove scientifically, mathematically, objectively the superiority of the West and its plutocratic allies? The West sees itself as a shining city on the hill, an example to the world, luxury skyscraper rising out of the sea of unsightly slums. But the so-called third world did not fail to develop. Rather, Rather, it is the direct result of our development. The slums beyond our borders are the shadow cast by our skyscrapers, the price the world paid for first world luxury.